Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, pick up your copy of All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. It's my newest ebook in which I examine the careers and histories of seven great fictional detectives and policemen, including Frank Cannon, Johnny Dollar, and of course, Joe Friday. And then some life lessons that be, can be learned from their career and history. If you enjoyed uh, my previous work, all I needed to know I learned from Columbo, you'll enjoy this. This one is available in the iBook store, Nook store, Kindle store, and you can pick it up at the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio store at store.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of The Saint. The original air date, January the 14th of 1951, and the title is Simon Takes a Curtain Call. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. They say each man kills the thing he loves. And so I have killed you, my love. But the cruel, merciful knife which parts our flesh shall bring us yet together in a together which is forever. I am ready, officer. Pardon me, but uh, where may I wait for Mr. Bennett? Well, he's still on stage taking down. Yes, I know. I was in the audience. My name is Templer. Oh, yes, Mr. Templer. He's expecting you. You can wait in the dressing room. It's right down the hall there. First on the right. The one with all the flowers on it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, darling. Did you really, did you? I enjoyed that. Thank you. See you shortly. Mercer. Come in, my dear. Ah, you are sweet, dear, but... Uh, oh, hello, Master. Congratulations. Simon Templer, how perfectly wonderful of you to come. Uh, as I was saying, my dear Shari, you are sweet and utterly charming throughout, but never, never cross in front of me. Never. Yes, Master, I remember. And you were magnificent. Thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, Shari, this is my old friend, uh, Simon Templer. Templer, Shari Babcock, my leading lady. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, go change, my dear. I'll, I'll meet you shortly. Of course, Mercy. Goodbye, Mr. Templer. Goodbye, Miss Babcock. Well, your taste is still excellent, Mercer. I picked my leaves on her acting ability alone, Templer. <laughs> <clears throat> now, uh, why I sent for you? Uh, by the way, uh, what did you think of the play? Well, uh, it was... Yes, uh, I know, I know. It, uh, I uh, took only five curtain calls, an ominous sign. Uh, for me, practically a curtsy. <laughs> oh, writers. Why, Templar, why don't they have writers like Shakespeare around these days? It's a plot against actors. I believe you. Uh, well, perhaps the Bennett name will carry this thing along for a season, but it will be a strain. Mercer, why did you send for me? Oh. Uh, sit down, Templar, while I remove my makeup. I am sitting down. Uh, well, then stand up. Uh, no, 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 don't. I hate to talk off to someone. I don't uh, work well that way at all. Templar, I'm afraid of this play. It scares me, too. Oh, no, 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 not that way. Uh, Templar, I've begun to notice a peculiar relationship between Mercer Bennett and his roles. Now, uh, you'll think this a bit eccentric of me, perhaps, but it's true. Templar. I'm living my roles. No. Wait, let me tell you. I don't know what it is. Perhaps I put too much of myself into a part, but the roles I portray on the stage, I also portray in real life. For example? For example, 
In Time Waits for Tomorrow, I played an actor who marries his leading lady. I married my leading lady. Astonishing. Waits. In Crossroads of the World, I played a singer who marries the ingenue. I married the ingenue. Laugh that off. I don't have to. I didn't marry her. You did. Yes. Uh, but I could go on, Templar. This thing has been plaguing me for years. I have a feeling of fatalism about any role I undertake. That it can't help being realized off stage. Why get excited about it now? Because, Templar, because in this play, I not only fall in love with my leading lady, but I kill her. Well, has the uh, first part come true? Well, one might say so, yes. She's utterly infatuated with me, of course, and she's a charming thing. I so. see. And you're afraid you're going to kill her? Deathly afraid. Well, it's been nice seeing you again, Mercer, but... Hey, wait, I... wait, don't go. I'm not just imagining things. The way the part was originally written, I shot Shari. But in our tryout in Boston, the prop man discovered that someone had put real bullets in the gun. Are you sure? Of course I am. That's why I had it rewritten to a knife. Uh, we use a rubber blade, of course. Of course. And you have no idea who put those bullets in the gun? None. It could have been anyone. Even you? That's what haunts me about this whole business, Templar. Could I have done it and not know it? Could I do it again? Oh, you've got to help me, Simon. Yeah. All right, I'll do what I can. But it might not be much. Oh, I'd appreciate it, Simon. I'd appreciate it immensely. And when we of the theater... Oh, please, no tears. Where should I start? Uh, my agent and business manager will uh, tell you whom to see. And they take you around. Oh. Uh, Stuart Jackson. Low fellow. Well, I'll see him in the morning. I'm deeply grateful, Simon. Why, I hardly dare look at the girl. I avoid her. I... Daddy? Daddy? Coming, Shari, darling. Coming. Uh, well, uh, you see, I... Uh... Yes, I know. The show must go on. <laughs> uh, see you tomorrow, Mercy. Well, mighty nice of you to take this on for us, Mr. Templer. I know it's been working on Mercer. What do you think of this, Jackson? This idea that Bennett has about his roles coming true. Well, I've represented a lot of actors, Mr. Templer, and they're screwy, every one of them. And I'm not sure Mercer Bennett's not the screwiest of the lot, but he's a great actor. You think this whole thing is about nothing? Huh? I didn't say that. It may be all in the head, but what's in the head gives plenty of trouble. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. And after the notices on the play this morning, he'll be screwier than ever. Not good? From Stinkville. And he needed the dough, too. Oh, I thought Bennett had plenty. Paying alimony to four wives? <laughs> Nobody's got that much dough. Well... The first one Bennett wants you to talk to is Lola Enright. She was his first wife. We're not going to talk to all four. Lola is the only one in town. Kind of an old lush, but a good kid. She used to be quite an actress. Well, let's go collect her autograph. Well, well, morning, Lola. Can we uh, come in? Hi, Mr. Jackson. Do come in. <laughs> I hope you'll excuse my deshabille. Just reading over a frightful stack of plays they're begging me to do. Frankly wearing, finding a vehicle. Ah, uh, uh, skip it, Lola. This isn't the producer. This is Simon Templer, the saint. Oh, why don't you say so? How do you do, Mr. Templer? Sit down. Thank you, Miss Enright. I've enjoyed your performances many times. Huh? Must be older than you look. <laughs> What's up, boy? Uh, Mr. Templer, I'd like to ask you a few questions, Lola, about uh. Mercer. Well, if you're going to talk about him, I've got to be fortified. Excuse me. Mr. Templer, have you ever met my friend? Huh? Oh, oh, yes, yes, I have. Oh, good. Then I don't have to introduce you. How about joining us? Well, I'm very fond of your friend, but not this early in the morning. About Mercer Bennett, Miss Enright. What about him? Well, very briefly, he has a fixation about roles he plays on the stage and acting themselves in real life. And in his latest play, he kills his leading lady. <laughs> Tell him not to worry. That turkey won't run long enough for him to step on an ant. Something has occurred, however, to indicate that this isn't all imagination. You know anyone bearing any ill will against uh, Bennett, Miss Henry? Sure I do. Anybody that knows him. Oh? Well, how about you, if I may be blunt? You mean, would I kill his leading lady and frame him with a murder? Um, let me think it over, Simon. Sure you don't want to say hello to my pal here? No, no thanks. Well, I do. Mercer Bennett. 
The problem being, would I like to see him accused of murdering his latest love? Well, I might. I very well might. Anything else I can do for you, Simon? Play Camille, butch candy between acts, tour with the South Pacific Company of South Pacific? If anything comes up, Lola, I'll let you know. Oh, you're a nice boy, Simon. I'll give you a tip. Never be seen in public with agents. So long, Jackson. Here's the crime, Simon. Happy days, Lola. Yeah? Happy days. <laughs> Well, what's the next port of call, Jackson? Arnold Prince, Mr. Templer. Broker, he says. Also has a lot of dough on the show. Oh, yes, you told me. Yeah. Uh, here's his office here. Mm. Hmm. No secretary. Guess we go right on in. Huh? I guess so. Oh, morning, Mr. Prince. You busy? Hello, Jackson. Have you seen the notices? Did you see those horrible, uh, uh, terrible... Uh, Mr. Prince, uh, this is Mr. Templer. Simon Templer. He wants to ask a couple of questions. Why? Because I think a crime may be committed, Mr. Prince, and I'm trying to prevent it. You're too late. The crime happened last night when three sixes of 17 opened. Yes, I can understand your point of view. Uh, tell me, Mr. Prince, what was your reason for putting money into the show? The play itself? I'll tell you. The reason was Shari Babcock. I was made a fool of. Shari was your girl? If I hadn't thought so, I wouldn't have put a cent into this egg. I couldn't afford the money. Do you hold any animosity toward Shari or Bennett? Toward both of them. How much animosity? Just this, Mr. Templer. I have a reputation for being a man it isn't safe to make a fool of. Do I make myself clear? I think so. Good. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, just one more question. Are you what they call an angel, Mr. Prince? An angel? <laughs> you needn't answer that. Good day. This is Shari Babcock's apartment, Mr. Templer. I hope you don't mind if I let you go in alone. I shudder at the thought. Uh, yeah. Well, being Mercer's business manager and agent, both, I got a lot of details to look after. He wanted you to talk to Charlie Glenway. He's the author of this bomb. But if you talk to Shari long enough, Charlie will be along. Get what I mean? I get what you mean. Uh, see you later, Mr. Templer. Good morning, Miss Babcock. I don't know if you remember me, but How I... could I forget? Uh, won't you come in, Mr. Templer? Simon? Oh, thank you, Shari. Have you seen the notices? Yes. Well, it was to be expected, of course. Charlie's a nice boy, but just not a writer. Just not a writer. Charlie, are you aware of the fact that as long as this play runs, you may be in considerable danger? Terribly exciting, isn't it? Huh? You're not frightened? But that's theater, Simon, dear. Actors living their roles, the excitement of opening night, the smell of grease paint. Sorry, sorry. Let's not do the grease paint in the veins bit, huh? <laughs> of course. You know about what happened in Boston? The real bullets instead of the blanks? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be fascinating if darling old Mercer had actually done it himself? I mean, conscious love, but subconscious hate. Fascinating, like, like Ibsen. Look, Hedda Gabler, did it ever occur to you that... Sorry. You seen the reviews? Not Charles, darling, not. Simon Templer, this is Charles Glenway, our uh, author. The rats desert the sinking ship. You thought the play was pretty hot stuff this time yesterday, Shari. Oh, uh, how are you, Templer? Thank you. Don't be rude, Charlie. And if one simply isn't a playwright, one should face it. Quote, Mercer Bennett, unquote. It was a play before he got hold of it, him and his rewrites. Of course it ended up garbage. It was bound to. Oh, speaking of rewrites, Charles, darling, I've got some ideas about the second act. My lines simply have to be fixed, you know. Your lines have to be fixed? Well, you certainly fixed them last night, all right. Why don't you get that dramatic school mush out of your mouth and, and talk? You think it improves things if nobody can hear you? In this case, yes. Am I intruding on anything? All right, all right. We, we won't fight, Shari. I don't want to. Fine, darling. And you will rewrite my lines in the second act. No. Yes. I'll keep score for you. Who is this guy, anyway? Another Arnold Prince? I was never anything to Arnold Prince but nice to him, so he put up the money for your show. How nice were you? Oh, Glenway, I hate you. <laughs> Sorry, darling. Mercer, sweet. Oh, oh Glenway. And Templer. <laughs> Sorry, old man. Shall I leave? Not at all, not at all. I mean, uh, don't rush off. 
About the notices, Charlie, darling. Disregard them. Of course, the play is bad. The thing to remember is that I've carried worse plays than this. You were younger then. Jealousy rearing its juvenile head. But it's a good thing you're here, Glenway. There's a lot of rewriting and fixing to be done. And you might possibly be of some help to me. I have an earth-shaking suggestion. Why not just do the play as it was written in the first place? You're questioning my knowledge of the theater. I think you're over the hill, Jack. Pay no attention to this, this scribbler, Mercer. Ah, uh, Keith. I find your conduct unprofessional, Glenway. We of the filter. And I find your conduct unbecoming to your fellow members in the Townsend Club, Bennett. Hands. Hmm? What did you say, Templar? I have been up since dawn trying to prevent a murder about which I now feel almost indifferent. I have foregone my breakfast, but I find myself unable and unwilling to do so another second. If anyone wants me, I should be in the restaurant on the corner, saving a life near and dear to me, my own farewell thespian. <laughs> Mr. Templer. Mr. Templer. Oh, sit down, Mr. Jackson. Sit down. But I warn you, if you interfere with my eggs benedict with Tabasco sauce, you're a dead man. Uh, Mercer phoned me as you were here, Mr. Templer. He wants you to come to the play tonight. I have seen the play. And every horrible detail is etched with acid on the dark mirror of my mind. You know, you talk just like Mercer. It must be contagious. Oh, we just got word, Mr. Templer. The play is closing tonight. A two-day run. Just ahead of the lynch mob. Do you carry insurance on your client, Mr. Jackson? Sure. And put him in another disaster like this and he'll need it. Oh, but what I wanted to tell you, Mr. Templer, was this. Mercer's worried about the prophecy, or whatever you want to call it. He's afraid that something will happen to Shari. And tonight's the last night for it to happen. You'll be there, Mr. Templer? Mm, against my complete better judgment, my appreciation of the aesthetic, and in utter disregard of my sanity, I shall be there. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Templer. Oh, hi, Charlie. Where have you been, huh? Out front. Uh, everything all right back here, Mr. Templer? Mm, it's all quiet so far. This is the final scene. Yeah, the death scene. Yeah. He uh, plays the violin to her before he stabs her. You think the audience is buying it, Mr. Templer? Well, they haven't stormed the stage as yet. It's not a bad play, or it wasn't at first. It's Bennett in the rewrite. Now it's all hash. How, how do you like Shari? As an actor? Promising. A bit theatrical, but she should have a good career ahead of her. If nothing happens. Nothing will happen. Hey, hey there's Prince backstage. I don't like that. I'll keep an eye on him. And there's Lola, too. She's... Uh... I know. She's Bennett's first wife. And she's bitter because he hasn't paid her alimony for years. Look, look. They're going into the death scene. Yeah, I'm watching, Charlie. Don't let anything happen to her, Mr. Templer. Charlie, hey, what's that on the prop table? Huh? A knife. Well, it's not a real one. It's like the one Bennett stabbed Shari with a rubber blade. But if that knife is here, what has Bennett got? What? Well, I don't know. Templer, I... Shari! Shari, look out! Hey, quick! Hold on the curtain, quick! Shari! Shari! Shari, are you hurt? What happened, Bennett? I... I don't know. I, I started to stab her like I always do, and, and blood came. I had the wrong knife. Let me, Templar. Shari. Shari, baby. How bad is it? Get a doctor, somebody. No, no, no doctors to spoil our last moment, Shari. Just you and me. Oh, it will always be you and me, Shari, always. No, no. The realization came too late. The bloom with us in the bud. It's fragrant, secret. Forever. Shari. Next week, East Lynn. Simon. Yes, Bennett? How bad is it, Simon? Is it fatal? Tell me, Simon. I can take it. Oh, the doctor said he had great difficulty finding the scratch. Scratch? Yes, it was a very minor flesh wound. Shari just couldn't resist playing a deathbed scene. You've got her well trained. Templar, do you realize what this will do for three sixes or seventeen? No, what? Publicity! Reams of publicity! The show will run for months! Where is she? Oh, she's in her dressing room. Come on. Shari! Mercy, you've 
come to say farewell to Get me. up, you lovesick ingenue. Put a bandage on that scratch. You've got a show to do tomorrow. But, Mercer, I'm dying. You couldn't be killed with a meat hat. Wait a minute, Bennett, that's no way. And order. I want to see you about some rewrites, Glenway, as soon as I talk to the press. We're not closing. Mercy, you are closing. What? Whether you like it or not, someone tried to kill Charlie tonight, and if the police had to pick a suspect, they would undoubtedly pick you. Yes, yes, perhaps they would. Perhaps they might even be right. Say nothing about this stabbing to anyone. Run one more night tomorrow night, and let everyone know the closing is definite after that, huh? Why? Why one more night? We've got one more night in which to catch a potential killer. See that everyone backstage tonight is here tomorrow. Lola, Prince, Jackson, Glenway. And? And you, certainly, Mercer. Definitely you. They say each man kills the thing he loves. And so I have killed you, my love. But the cruel, merciful night which parts our flesh shall bring us yet together in a together which is forever. I am ready, officer. Nothing happened. The play's over, Mr. Tedwin. Nothing happened. Charlie's safe. Not quite yet, Charles. Well, what do you mean? Mr. Burnett, Mr. Burnett, Mr. Burnett, Mr. Burnett, no calls tonight. No calls tonight, Ben. None. As you say, Mr. Burnett, don't bring it up, Joe. Oh, God, I'm oh, yes, darling. Well, Simon, the role is over. The play is finished. And the leading man did not kill his leading woman. No, he didn't, Mercer. Come on, Charlie, let's get out of here. No, Charles. Why not, Simon? The play is over. Not quite yet, Mercer. You forget that in your own play, Charlie, the murder occurred at six minutes past eleven. It's now just 10.45. You're suggesting we stay here until 6 after 11? I'm suggesting it very strongly. Charles, would you ask Lola, Arnold Prince, and Stuart Jackson to join us? They're all backstage. Okay, Mr. Templer. What are you expecting, Simon? Shy, I'm expecting another attempt on your life. There have been two already. I intend to see that this is the final one. But... What if it's a success? If my theory is correct, it won't be. The saint is never wrong, Shari. Are you? Well, hardly ever. <laughs> Let's join the others, shall we? I'm giving a theater party. How much longer are we going to have to sit here, Templar? Oh, just a few minutes, Mr. Prince. It's after 11 now. I'm getting very dry, Simon, old boy. Patience, Lola, patience. It's creepy in here with everyone gone. I don't like being the bait in a trap. You have a whole squad of protectors, Charlie. Except that one of them could be a murderer. Got any theories on the case, Mr. Templer? Oh, a few, Jackson. Three minutes after 11. Well, I guess we've got time to hear some of them. It will pass the time. In this case, the question seems to be motive. Who would profit by killing Shari? Or who would profit by framing Bennett here with the killing of Shari? Always presuming that the assailant is not Bennett himself. Thank you. Mr. Arnold Prince. A motive, certainly. I agree with you. A rejected suitor who feels himself used badly. She's a little... Why, you... Gentlemen, gentlemen, no violence until six after eleven. Mr. Prince lost money he could ill afford to lose. He thought he lost Miss Babcock to Mr. Bennett, and so had reason to hate them both. Stick around, Mr. Prince. Don't worry. I wouldn't miss Shari's murder for twice as much dough as I poured in this raffle. Oh, Miss Lola Enright. A motive, perhaps? Love. Desperate, hopeless love for this road company, Barrymore, and hatred for the younger rival. Right, Simon? Couldn't have done it better myself. I'll stick around, Simon. <laughs> Mr. Mercer Bennett. A strange fixation that he is destined to carry out whatever roles he plays on the stage. A mania, perhaps? I've tried to get him to an analyst, Mr. Templer, many times. Ask him. Shut up, Jackson. Tempers are getting edgy as we approach the hour. Mr. Charles Glenway, one of the best of motives. What? Oh, I might warn you, I don't know if the electrician knows we're still here, so we might find ourselves in the darkness. Simon! And then it might not happen at all. I see, where were we? Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, Charles Glenn. Oh, Charlie couldn't do it, Simon. He... Ah! All, right, all, right. all right, drop it, you. Drop it, or I'm going to break your wrist. Drop it. There. 
All right, Sam, you can put the lights back on. Sam! Run away, Mr. Simpler! Ah, there. What happened? Who was it? Jackson. Yes, Jackson. Pick up his knife, Charlie. Yeah, sure. Anything to say, Mr. Jackson? Plenty. But not here. Smart fellow. But why Jackson Templer? He was my agent. He was making a good living out of me. Not good enough. He was also your business manager. He told you you were paying alimony to all four of your ex-wives. Lola hasn't gotten anything in years, right? Right. Yeah, this suggested the juggling of your books. And then I'm always suspicious of business managers anyway. He also told me he had your life insured. If you were to die for the murder of Charlie Babcock... Jackson would be a rich man, and no questions asked about his books, either. But why, Jackson? You were still collecting commissions from me. Shall I tell him, Jackson, or will you? I'll tell him. You're just about through, you big ham. You can't play leading men anymore. You're too old. Ah, sharper than the serpent's tooth. Mm, the French say, cherchez la femme. The Anglo-Saxons say, cherchez la financial angle. Anything I've left out, Jackson? Yes. I hate actors. I've always hated them. And Bennett, I hated worst of all. Sneering at us all the time. Running us down behind our backs. I hate them! Oh, I've always suspected this about agents. <laughs> I must be more careful. Now, come along, Jackson. I can get you a long contract with no option. <laughs> Templar. Yes, Mason. After you turned Jackson in, uh, you didn't give the full story to the papers, did you? The, uh, the the full story? Not yet. Why? Don't. Don't as a favor to me. Oh, but this will be wonderful publicity for your show. It will run forever. I'd rather you didn't. But why, Mason? Well, uh, uh, Jackson's uh, statement about me being too old for leads... Uh, uh, of course, it's totally untrue, but if word of a charge like that gets around show business, well, you know it. Yes, I see, I see. Uh, my lips are sealed. Thanks, Templar, thanks. <laughs> ah, me, maybe the trouble is I'm not wearing a tight enough girdle, or maybe chin straps for I sleep at night. Actors. You know, Jackson may have been right. <laughs> You have been listening to another transcribed adventure of the saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. Now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, it's difficult to comprehend the fact that you can hold life itself in the palm of your hand. The shape it takes isn't particularly dramatic. It's as simple as this. A few coins, a few dollars, your contribution to the Red Cross. The life you hold is that of some unknown person who will be restored to health through the Red Cross National Blood Program. That program is already in its second year. It still hasn't been fully developed. It still isn't bringing the amazing medicine of whole blood to all those who need it. That won't come without more doctors, nurses, technicians, and equipment. That won't come without your help. The only thing that makes it possible for the Red Cross to carry on its mission of mercy. More than 1,500 hospitals have been supplied free of charge with blood and blood derivatives. More than half a million pints have already been provided for medical use. And yet this is only part of the Red Cross program. The Red Cross follows in the wake of disasters of all kind, treating the injured, feeding the hungry, and sheltering the homeless. From the Red Cross emanates a network of services to the armed forces, to veterans, to the community as a whole. The complete cost of all these operations for the next year will be $67 million. But the cost to you is whatever you can give to help the helpless. Remember, all of us can help through the Red Cross. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This 
This Adventure of the Saints was written by Dick Powell. Our cast included Theodore Von Elf as Bennett and Mary Ship as Shoddy. Ed Begley was Jackson, Maggie Morley, Lola. Prince was played by Stanley Farrar and Charlie by Bob Clark. Harry Brown was the doorman. The Saints, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production of His Kind of Woman. All you Saints fans will be glad to know that Mr. Price is guest editor of the January issue of Inside Detective, world's largest selling detective magazine. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The chimes are ringing for tonight's broadcast of The Big Show, radio's greatest spectacle. Your stars for this evening's Big Show, in addition to the unpredictable Tallulah, will be Louis Calhern, Jimmy Durante, Jack Carter, Martha Ray, and many, many more. For drama tonight, Theater Guild on the Air presents a one-hour adaptation of the fascinating story Trilby, starring Rex Harrison and Teresa Wright. So remember, The Big Show and Theater Guild on NBC. Welcome back. I could definitely appreciate uh, when Simon decided to go off and get some breakfast. That sounded more appealing than dealing with these uh, people. Um, th- this was not one of my favorite episodes, but it still did have some good uh, points. And in the end, the Saint uh, definitely... Uh, work things out uh, marvelously without uh, anyone actually dying. So the agent's not going to go to prison for the rest of his life, but probably for a good long while. Uh, The idea of substituting a uh, knife in a stage play as a method of murder is an interesting plot idea. They did it on an episode of Monk. And, of course, it occurs to me that uh, a rubber-tipped knife and a real knife are going to have a very different feel. They did something in the episode of Monk. I won't spoil it for you. But it's the uh, season two episode, uh, Mr. Monk Goes to the Theater. It was an interesting take on this whole uh, idea. Well, now we turn to some listener comments and feedback. And Brian has a good question about the saint. I really love the saint in Vincent Price. I was wondering if he did the Price of Fear radio show around this time period. You commented after the show that his horror movies and uh, shows were to come later. Was there any major radio star that actually had two different weekly uh, uh, shows on the air during the same time period? The Price of Fear was actually a BBC radio program. Uh, that actually aired for the first time uh, in the 1970s. So it was uh, not at that uh, uh, time frame. In terms of weekly radio stars, uh, in terms of of just uh, general, uh, Phil Harris, who uh, appeared on the uh, Jack Benny program, also has his own uh, series with his wife, uh, Alice Fay. This got a bit complicated when the Phil Harris and Alice Fay show was uh, still on uh, NBC while Jack Benny had moved to CBS. And so what uh, Phil Harris needed to do was he would stay for the first uh, about uh, 20 minutes of the Jack Benny program, and then he would run across the way to the NBC studios so he'd be ready to do his own show. Eventually, this was resolved once Phil Harris and Alice Faye moved over to CBS. In dramatic radio, the only one I can think of who held down starring roles in two series at once, uh, it happened twice as far as I can uh, remember, and both times that I'm absolutely aware of it happened with Jack Webb. In 1949, as summer was approaching, a decision was made to put Pat Novak for hire on hiatus. Uh, But he needed a job during the summer. He and his wife had a baby on the way. So he needed uh, a radio program. He came up with the idea for Dragnet was able to get NBC to agree to give it a trial. But it actually began uh, while uh, Pat Novak for hire was uh, still running. And so there was a uh, four-week period where you could turn to ABC and hear Jack Webb playing uh, Pat Novak. 
and then uh, you could turn to NBC and hear him playing uh, Joe Friday. And it got a little bit confusing because at the very end, Raymond Chandler, who played uh, Inspector Hellman, uh, became the first actor to play Ed ba- or the second actor to play Ed Backstrand, uh, Chief of Detectives. I remember during that period, uh, it was just after that period, one listener uh, commented that with uh, Raymond Chandler in both roles, he was expecting uh, Ed Backstrand to frame Friday for murder. The other instance was uh, intentional on Webb's part. He launched a series called uh, P. Kelly's Blues, which we played uh, previously, where he played... 1920s uh, jazz cornet player uh, Pete Kelly. And there was mystery, there was intrigue, there was even a couple of plot lines recycled from Pat Novak for hire. The series ran for 13 weeks, and he didn't really expect it to run any longer. That that was an effort, I think it was a labor of love, uh, because Pete Kelly's blue, it was a project he pursued to a movie, and to uh, a television show later. Um, So, Jack Webb, and I wouldn't be surprised if Orson Welles during the war had something, though. Uh, I've not uh, done uh, deep research, but Welles had so many radio uh, projects that were running concurrently, I would not be surprised if one of them uh, crossed over. Now we turn to some comments regarding uh, episode 1545, Simon Minds the Baby. Gypsy says this was such a sweet episode. Uh, Beverly said, uh, I think uh, Vincent Price was born looking like that picture, referencing the picture we use at greatdetectives.net on all sane episodes. Did you know he was an art collector? His collection toured the country in the late uh, 60s, and I was privileged uh, to see it. Um, I'm definitely aware that uh, he was a man of many talents and many uh, interests and causes, lived a very uh, full life, uh, which you can't always say of uh, every uh, every person who was an actor in that period. Uh, then uh, just a comment from Mark uh, who says that, he w- that uh, Vincent Price was the best radio saint, and you'll get no argument from me on that, Mark. All right, well, that will uh, do it for listener comments. I have mentioned the idea on previous programs about uh, filling in missing armchair detective segments when we uh, get to Ellery Queen with uh, segments uh, recorded featuring listeners who will have listened to the first part of the program. We'll try to guess along with uh, Ellery Queen, because that was just one of those things that Ellery Queen was uh, known for, and I think it would add to the experience. Uh, So if you'd be interested in being an armchair detective, let me know. We definitely need to hear from enough people to uh, make that happen. Uh, Send your emails to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, that will do it for today. We'll be back tomorrow with the lineup. Join us next Monday for another episode of The Saint. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter.